You're listening to Living Out Our Faith in a Fallen World, a series preached from the book of James by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. Father, we come this morning, and Lord, we're always aware of our desperate need for you. And Lord, I am fully aware this morning of our need for you. And so God, I pray that you would show yourself strong on our behalf, that you would open up the truth of your word to us this morning. Spirit of God, I pray that you'd work in our midst and that you'd use this message and this lesson, this word, to change our hearts and our lives of all those who are here and those who are listening. And so, Lord, help us to be intentional. Give me freedom, boldness, power, courage, strength, and grace. I ask in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Four and five-year-olds are dismissed at this time as they're finding their way. I'd invite you to turn in your Bible to James chapter 1. We'll be referencing that as our, our passage that we're in this morning. I have to warn you this morning that uh, the text that we are in and the message this morning will be like a fire hydrant going off. There's lots of stuff to cover, and I really do want to get to all of my three points um, at the end, but there's a lot to weigh through until we get there. And so uh, if you're a guest or visitor, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Um, For the rest of you, just buckle in, because here we go, all right? We've been talking in James chapter 1, verses 12 through 17 over the last several weeks. Last week, we were not in the text. Pastor Dan had communion service. But we've been talking about the difference between a test and a trap. And so we've spent lots of time on the test, that a test is designed to reveal what is true of us. The fire is turned up, the heat is turned up, and what's truly inside then is exposed. And the fact of the matter is, we need this. Socrates said, an unexamined life is not worth living. And the truth is, we should be examining our lives, we should be honest with assessing our lives, and we need these tests by God, to reveal what is true in us. Not what my friends think is true in me, not what I think is true in me, but what is actually the truth of who I am and where I'm at and how I have grown. We need these tests. They're a good thing. They reveal what's true in us. But there are also traps. And the trap is not a test to reveal. It's a trap to ruin us, to ruin us, every one of us this morning, and it is associated with evil. And so two weeks ago, we looked at our text, and James gave us the plan that is always in place that Satan uses for the trap. These steps do not change. And two weeks ago, I asked you to take notes. Do you remember? How many folks remember that? No one? Okay, very good. How many took notes? Good. I'm, 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 I'm shocked, actually. Thank you. So, in this plan that we were made privy to last week, there were five different steps that lead us to ruin. Class, the first one was attraction. Attraction. That our own desires see something out of place in God's time, in God's way, and God's purpose. It's a desire from within. It's something we long for, and we're drawn away by that. What looks to be good is not. It's a lure. It's a bait. It's to catch our eyes, and our beliefs begin to change. That's attraction. Step number two was deception. Deception. Young people, you're doing fantastic this morning. The rest of you, eh, all right? (laughs) Deception. And that's when we have a litany of reasons now that come to our heads because we want what we, we should not have, and now we say things like this, I deserve this. It's not so bad. No one will ever know. It will be different this time, and we begin to deceive ourselves about what's happening. Attraction, deception, number three, Preoccupation, and it's not a race. You don't have to win every time. (laughs) All right? Preoccupation, which means at this point and this step, this thought 
And this desire is on loop in my mind. And all I think about is going, going and, and taking that step into that action. We're obsessed with this desire that we know is wrong, and yet now we've deceived ourselves by telling ourselves somehow, some way, it's okay. Number four, conception. Conception. At this stage, something is born, but it's not life, it's death. And then finally, the last stage, subjection. Now he's not saying anything. You're a punk. <laughs> subjection, which means now I'm caught in a trap. Now I become a slave to this desire. And now, whether I know it or not, I have a cruel, cruel task master. And this is the plan. The mechanics of all temptation and sin are all the same. Our desires may be different, but the design of temptation is as old as time. It's not changed from the days in the garden, and this is how it works in everyone's life. And so we saw that two weeks ago. It's like, great, now I know how this works. And so from this point forward, it's smooth sailing. I see it. I know it. I can be aware of it. But here's the problem. All of us, most of us as believers, we have already been aware of this most of our lives. It's like the great philosopher Mike Tyson once said. <laughs> Why don't you laugh at that? Everyone has a plan until they're punched in the face. Right? And we can sit in church this morning and act like, yes, 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 yes. I know the plan. But you're going to be punched in the face. It's amazing when that happens, most of our plans fly out the window. It's interesting in our text in James chapter 1, I think it's verse number 16, James says, do not be, my brothers, my sisters, don't be deceived. Why would James say to Christians, don't be deceived? Because we're deceived. We're deceived. And James wants us to know not to be deceived when we get punched in the face with temptation. And so that's the plan. It does not change. It is what it is. It operates in every one of our lives the same way. It will not change. If you're honest this morning, you can see the patterns in your own life. We've been there. We've done that. We bought the T-shirts. It's for, same for all of us. But this morning, as we know the plan now, if we're going to really have victory in these struggles, we must be persuaded of at least two things this morning. Number one, we must be persuaded that sin is dreadful. Not a game, not a joke, not something to play with. That sin is dreadful. I know we live in a culture that don't want to talk about sin, but the problem with our world today is sin. And, and you, can, you, can, you can give the de any definition you want of sin. There's lots of good definitions. But sin is any desire that's prohibited outside the word of God. It is anything that we do, think, say, or act upon that is contrary to the good heavenly father that we worship this morning. Sin is dreadful. And it's dreadful in a number of ways. First, it's deceptive. Sin is deceptive. Listen, every temptation we have, it never presents itself to the end. Right? The first thought, the first picture is always pleasure. It's good. You deserve. This will change your life in good ways. It will bring you peace, happiness, contentment, and everything you ever imagined. It's deceptive because it's never true. Sin never pulls back the curtain to show you the end result. And there's always an end result. It never shows you the pain the guilt, the suffering, the regret, and the brokenness. Sin is dreadful because it's deceptive. It presents itself in a way that's not true. Not only that, it's deceptive personally. The person this morning that lies to you most, yeah, it's not your kids. It's yourself. And we have this inner monologue all the time telling ourselves, lies. And so sin comes along and we buy into it 
and we start repeating the mantra that it told us to repeat, and we are deceiving ourselves. And if you're like me, I'm quick with the excuses. I'm quick to justify, but I'm lying to myself. It's deceptive personally, and it's deceptive in the people that we do life with. You do know that sin longs to stay in the dark. When you bring it to the light, it's kicking and screaming. In the dark, it flourishes. In the dark, it grows. And you can tell how deep you're in by how you hide from certain people what's really going on in your life. Who are the people that you don't want them to know or scroll on your phone or check your history or know about that conversation, right? It's deceptive in our relationships and it ruins everything. You know this. I think you know this. The fact of the matter is, in our lives, what we long for and what we all truly want is to be fully known. I want someone in my life who truly, fully knows me. Like, really. Not, not to suit the tie, but behind closed doors. Truly knows me, and yet, still, fully loves me. That's the heartbeat of, of humanity. This is what Adam and Eve had in the beginning. They were fully known, truly known, and fully loved. And when sin enters into our life, there's no authenticity. There is no transparency. There is lie upon lie upon lie. And we have to question in our heads and our minds, would they really love me if they knew? Sin is dreadful. It's deceptive. But not only that, Sin is destructive. You have heard this phrase, and we hear it, and we don't even think about it, but it's so true. Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you far more than you're willing to pay. It doesn't change. It's destructive because it always has consequences. This morning, as we we think about that, that digression, you and I come to a point where we can choose to sin but we do not get to choose the consequences of our sin. Listen to me. You can choose, but you don't get to choose the consequences, and there are always consequences. Listen to Baxter. He is fantastic. He says this, Impenitent sin and damnation are conjoined. If you choose one, God will cause the other. Choose one, and you shall not choose whether you shall have the other. And this is a phrase I I love. If you shall have the serpent, you shall have the sting. And sin never shows that to you. Never. It's dreadful. This morning, if we're going to go on this journey of having victory, not obedience, obedience, when it comes to temptation, We must be persuaded that sin is dreadful. Number two, we must be persuaded that God's gifts are desirable. And I I probably should have started with this one um, because because so often in our lives, Christians are known for what we're against. Like, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls that do, right? This is probably good advice. But it seems often that the world knows everything that we're against and not what we're for. And that's a problem. That's a real problem because it's more than that. And if we, we have that idea, then it comes along across like God is a killjoy in our lives and that our lives are just glum and meaningless. And that's not the case. Not the case at all. I want you to know this morning, we must be persuaded that God's gifts are desirable. Look with me, if you would, at Psalm 16, verse 11. This is a great passage of Scripture. The psalmist says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Okay, hear it again, because you just weren't listening. Listen. Life. 
real life in a culture of death, this is our God. Joy in a world full of sadness and despair and pleasure forevermore in an age where everything is fleeting and insatiable. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me right now. Life, joy, pleasure. This is our God. And our God gives good gifts. That's what James tells us. They are good. Why? Because the God of heaven, the creator of humanity, who created us, knows what he created us for. He knows how we're made to run. He knows what brings true flourishing in our life. He knows the fuel you need. And the world doesn't have it. They don't possess it. He is good. And his ways are desirable. And and listen to this. Um, I'm speaking to people this morning who are just like me. We're all broken. All of us are broken people. And if we're honest this morning, we think about temptation, we can't even count the times we have blown it and failed and fallen over and over and over again. And yet, God's gifts are still available and desirable for us now. This is the God we serve. That even in my brokenness, after my failures, time and time again, when I would have given up on myself, let alone you, on myself, he says, I will not break a bruised reed that's about ready to crumble. I will not quench a smoking wick that's about to be extinguished. That's not who I am because I am good and my gifts are good even in our brokenness. I've read, I don't know how many times I've read Isaiah 61. It's fantastic. And I've read it so many times, verse number three, um, they're powerful. Just listen to what he says. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. These are broken people who God says, this is what I do. This is who I am. This is how I operate. But they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. That's beautiful. You should, you should see this and know this and embrace this and tell yourself this. But what I've never noticed ever, in my, I'm, I'm 54 years old. I've read the Bible more than once. I have never noticed verse 4. And look what it says. Speaking of these broken people, and they shall rebuild the old ruins. Our old ruins. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Do you know what he's saying there? God is so good that in our brokenness and ruin, he comes along and says, listen, you don't have to be what you used to be. You don't have to be controlled by your anger, your lust, your greed, your dysfunction, because I have said you will be able to rebuild the desolations of many generations. This is our God. There's a song, and I will not sing it this morning, but the song is from the story, talking about the life of Joseph, and it says this, I am not my family tree. These are different leaves, you know. There are miles and miles between my roots and what I'm trying to grow. I have dreamed a thousand dreams and watched a grain in famine grow. I am not my family tree. I have branches of my own. Hey, you come out of dysfunction, guess what? We have branches of our own now, and they're glorious. This is how good God is. And so we must be persuaded when temptation comes that I know sin is dreadful, but God's gifts are desirable. Not only, de- not only are they desirable, but they are also doable. When he's talking now about overcoming temp- t- temptation, they're doable. First uh, Corinthians 10, 13, you know this. Look at the verse. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above or beyond that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 
So now we're talking about temptation again, right? And, and there's no such thing as you sitting here saying, well, nobody knows. Nobody understands. Nobody can see or gauge. No. God says all of them are common to us. All of them. They may not be exactly alike, but the basic elements of the problem are not significantly different from what others have fa- faced. And he says, um, you don't have to fall to those things. It's not beyond what you are able. Believer, this morning, listen to me. As, we, as we're about to, to sort of jump into now the practical steps, Paul is saying to believers when it comes to temptations and, and all the troubles we face, you cannot say, I can't. You and I cannot say when we're faced with this temptation for the umpteen time that I can't. Paul says, no, that's not true. You are able. God has made it able. Why? Because he is faithful. That's what James just said in, in uh, James 1, 16 to 17. He said, but God is faithful. Every good gift and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation nor shadow of turning. And so James is agreeing with Paul this morning that anything we face, I cannot say I can't at all. All right? So that's the foundation. Now, I want to say something to you quickly and then move on to the three points. The great thing about the book of James is this. This this book always generates great conversations. And so two weeks ago, um, I was stepping out, and one of our dear deacons stopped me and said, hey, you do know that the answer to all of these steps, the bottom line answer is that we live by faith. And he's exactly right. Believer, we are called this morning to live by faith. And listen, if you're not believer, if you're not a believer this morning, every person on the planet lives by faith today. Every one of them. When you got up this morning and you turned on your faucet, you believed that water would come out, unless you know you've not been paying the bill. You, you believe that. When you put your key in the ignition this morning, you believe the car, for most of us, would start, right? When you get in the car to take a trip to your vacation or your destination, you believe that you will land there. And when you have surgery and they tell you to count backwards by 10, you believe in faith that this surgeon will do what he said. It's faith. And you believe that not because it's blind faith, but because there is evidence or substance or weight to what's been said or experience on what's been done. God calls his people to live by faith. And our faith is much greater because our faith is that we are counting on the revelation of God himself. Uh, I just heard uh, Greg Kogel say this the other day about the Bible. He said, the Bible is the account of the most important things in life given by the most reliable source in the universe. That's the word we have. The Bible has a perfect track record Everything that it has ever said can be verified by human history. I'm not talking about the Quran this morning. I'm not talking about Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormons with fairy tales within them. Archaeology is always backing the Bible. Even when they said it didn't happen now, 20 years ago we find out it was just like the Word of God said. What it says about human behavior, human experience, has been proven to be true. And don't even start talking about prophecy. Hundreds and thousands of years before the event ever happened, the Bible pegged it right on. We put our faith in God's word. We believe. And it's not blind. It has substance. It has evidence to it. And that belief is to move into behavior. This morning, believer, we're to live by faith. We are staking our lives lives on the word of God. And so in every step of this, this attack that we face, the answer is faith. Attraction, being drawn away, what does faith tell us? God's gifts are good. They're life, joy, they're pleasure. It tells us the world is passing away and the lust thereof, but he who does the will of God will abide forever. When it comes to deception, it tells us, sanctify them through thy truth. Your word is truth. It goes on to tell us that Satan is a liar and the father of lies. He always lies, and the wages of sin is death of death. 
He goes on to tell us some preoccupation. Sorry, I just lost my place, but don't worry about it. I'm back. So preoccupation. He tells us that what should it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or how we think, what sort of things are pure, lovely, just, noble, honest, think on these things. And even in the point of conception and subjection, he tells us to repent. We've been reading our Bible through this year. We find ourselves in Jeremiah right now. And I'm amazed at Israel's history. It's terrible. It's terrible. And Jeremiah, once again, it's terrible. And the amazing thing to me about their history and my life is that at any point in the equation, one thing we have to do, and just one, repent. Repent. By faith, repent. I thought this way, I moved this way, I repent, I turn around. That is the answer, even in conception and subjection. I repent. We confess our sin. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness by faith. My little children, sin not, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. We are no longer slaves. We are free, and who Christ sets free is free indeed. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So the plan, persuasion, and now here's the practical. Three things this morning. Number one, when we think about temptation, when we think about these plans, this, this attraction, deception, occupation, conception, and subjection, very good. Practical things to do. Number one, we seize the day. We seize the day. Carpe diem. Engage in the battle. Arm yourself. What we're talking about is not theory. This is real life for the believer. And the Bible makes it clear. Christianity is not described as sunshine, roses, unicorns, and lollipops. It says it's a journey. It's a fight. It's a war. And there is no discharge in this war. Listen, when we come to Christ, we are a new creation. We are new creatures, which means those old desires Desires will come in conflict with the new. There's no way around it. And for many of us, what we have to understand this morning is there was a time in our lives when we ran toward hell. Running toward hell. And God in his mercy stepped in and saved us. Listen to what Peter says. This is one of the most beautiful things. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who was suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough, listen, we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them at the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you, that they may give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Peter says, listen, in times past, you ran toward hell with everything you have. Now, in Christ, we need to run toward holiness with everything we have. We have a new master. We have a new destination, a new destiny. We have a new hope, a new mission, a new work. We have been redeemed. And so God says, listen to me, seize, arm yourself. This is true now. Seek after holiness. Again, another word that the world's not comfortable with, it means living unto God. This morning, my brother and sister, in our battle with temptation, seize the day. Embrace it. This is real life in the trenches. Don't be weak. Don't be anemic. When you fall down, get back up again and again and again. Do not quit. We have mantras in our families that say things like our family says. Dresslers don't quit. You're going to start corn to tasseling? Guess what? You ain't quitting. Young people, you're not quitting. You shouldn't have quit. Don't quit. Builds character. You think you're funny in grade eight and you're going to take a, a knitting class with your buddies and after a week you're going to stop? 
No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't quit. And today he makes beautiful scarves and blankets. <laughs> Sorry. That's so easy. So easy. Seize the day. What are you here for? What are you doing? To be the same person you've been your whole life? No, we're not. We are here to proclaim that Jesus Christ saved us and changed us, and he's still at work in our hearts and lives. Seize the day. Number two, our steps must be radical. When we're talking about temptation in our own lives, our steps must be radical. Look with me, if you would, at Matthew chapter 6, verse 13. And, and this makes perfectly good sense, and some of you are confused about what Jesus says in the Lord's Prayer. We pray this, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. MacArthur says this, the redeemed soul that so despises and fears sin that it wants to escape all prospects of falling into it, choosing to avoid rather than having to defeat temptation. And, and this is a prayer. God, sin is dreadful. And I don't even want to be led in any area that I've got to defeat it. I want to stay, I want to flee from those things. Listen, the Bible says in James 4, maybe 6 or 7 or 8, somewhere in there, but it says, um, resist the devil and he will flee from you. And that's right, we put up a fight. But you know, more often than not, the Bible tells us to flee. To flee. These won't be on the wall, just listen to them. Flee sexual immorality, 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee youthful passions, 2 Timothy 2.22. Flee idolatry, 1 Corinthians 10.14. And flee materialism, 1 Timothy 6.11. And our Lord and Savior encourages every one of us that our steps in this area must be radical. Again, this is not a game. We're not talking about, oh, you just burned your hand on a fire. We're talking about ruin in our lives. We must be radical. Again, the words of Jesus... Matthew 18, 8, if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It's better to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two eyes or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Verse 9, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It's better to go into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast hellfire what Jesus said. And so you might be wondering, why aren't there more blind people who are Christians? <laughs> That's what I wonder. Is he telling us literally to pluck out our eyes? And no, no. But what he's saying is, when it comes to sin, it is so dreadful that we must take radical steps to stay away from it. If you're on a diet, you don't go to the buffet. Right? It's like the woman who was praying. She's on a diet, and she wanted a Tim Hortons donut. And so she said, Lord, if it's your will that I don't have a donut, make the parking lot be full. <laughs> so she gets in, and do you know what happened? After 10 times around, there was an empty space, and she thought it was God's will that she could have a donut. Radical steps. Radical. If you, if you have a problem with anger, maybe give Walmart a break for a while. <laughs> right? Just stay out of there until you realize your own idols in your life of control and hatred, and you're the greatest person in the world, and you're a me monster with your cart in the center of the aisle facing the wrong way, all right? Radical, radical. If you have a problem with alcohol this morning, or drug abuse, you don't stop at the bar on your way home. You don't hang out with drug addicts. It's not how you're going to get victory. You are setting yourself up for failure. I'm strong enough. False. You are not strong enough. No one is. And we have a bunch of former alcoholics and drug addicts who can tell you just that. You've got to do something radical. You cut off those relationships because you're the problem. If you have an attraction to someone who is not your spouse, you do not have lunch with them or go on business trips alone. 
called the Billy Graham rule. He lived by it, and people mocked him. They mocked him for it, but guess what? Billy Graham, no scandal. None. None. If you have a problem with lust this morning, and you know this is where I go all the time, then don't go to the site. Don't scroll through Instagram in the middle of the night. And if you have to be radical, get a flip phone. I can't live like that. That's fine. But that lust will destroy your life. It will destroy your life. And some of you this morning are really glad because you haven't been hit yet. What about the sin of gossip? Um, 1 Corinthians 6.10, that's not up there either, but it talks about these are the people that will not inherit the kingdom of God and such were some of you. And that list is powerful. One of the things in there is a reviler, someone who engages in slander. Gossip. If you know that you are prone to gossip and slander and talk about things that you have no idea and about people you've never met or you're going to assume, then maybe you should quit going to the Dutch market as often as you do. Uh, did that hit it? I'm sorry. If that hit a nerve, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You Dutch, you know. You know everything. You know everything. Am I right, Dutch people? Am I right? You're lying. I am right. I am right. I- I'm right. And, and, we, and we, we, we make excuses for it because I'm praying for them or everybody knows. And it's like, no, if that's the case, you might want to change your crowd and you might want to do this. Go apologize to the person you've been talking to or about. Just walk up and say, listen, you got to forgive me. My brother, my sister, my friend, I've been going here with our friends and we've been, we've been slaughtering your reputation. Do that once, radically. And I promise you the next time before you say a word, you'll think about it. That's what Jesus is talking about. We must, as Owen said, be killing sin, or sin will be killing us. And too many Christians, you're you're on the side of the road because you've been killed by sin over and over again because you won't radically deal with it. Why live like that? There's a better way. And then finally this morning, seek the Savior and keep seeking him. Um, there are so many wonderful things in the word of God, but often they can easily edge out Jesus. The crown jewel of Christianity is Jesus Christ. He is altogether lovely. He is altogether beautiful. And in our struggles and our battles, the person we must seek is Jesus Christ. Seek the Savior and keep seeking him. I've been sort of on a rabbit trail this week. I was looking at the comparison between the first Adam and the second Adam. You'll see why in a second when we we read the book of of Romans. Um, Maybe I'm heading, nope, Romans. Um, But there's there's the Bible talks about the first Adam who is Adam, and the second Adam, who's Christ. And it's amazing. The first Adam was a co-ruler who wanted to be a sole ruler. And so he disobeyed and brought death. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, was a creator who brought life back into the world. The first Adam hides from from judgment. Adam, where are you? He's hiding. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, sets his face toward Jerusalem, knowing what's to come and completely drinks dry the cup of God's wrath. The first Adam, sin comes into the world, occasioned by a tree. The second Adam overcomes sin by obedience to a tree. The first Adam is told, disobey, you will die. The second Adam says, if you obey, you'll be crushed, and you will die. And both of them experienced deep sleep and a pierced side that produced a beautiful bride. Isn't that awesome? It's awesome. But this is the one I want to talk about this morning. Adam with Eve in the beautiful garden, with harmony, peace, all of creation in line. They disobey, and they bring death, destruction, and disharmony. The second Adam is alone in the wilderness. Alone, by himself, 40 days of fasting, 
with, interesting enough, Mark says, the wild animals, which is the flip of the original creation and completely obeys. And for you and I as believers this morning, we must seek Christ constantly because he is the one who was tempted and did not disobey, completely obeyed and overcame. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 this morning. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. My friend, in our struggle with temptation, we have great examples in our life. But don't run to men and women. They will fail you. I will fail you. People will fail you. Pastors will fail you. Family will fail you. Jesus Christ will not. He took the weight of sin and the temptation. He experienced all of it, the fullness, the, the weight of it that never let up. We quit. We stop. We get weary. He never did, and he was obedient. That same spirit lives in you. We seek Christ and keep seeking him. And then number two and finally, we seek his sacrifice. Romans 6, verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also shall we be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. My friend, the gospel of Jesus Christ, going back to that sacrifice, reminds us that Christ has triumphed over sin, death, and the grave, and all of its effects. This is our central hope. Do you understand, as believers this morning, I was saved as a young man. Today, I am saved. The truth is, we are all in the process of being saved, and ultimately, we will be saved from even the presence of sin. And so, we constantly go back to that sa sacrifice, that through his death, burial, and resurrection, we are designed to live in newness of life. The old man is dead. As Christ died and was buried, so we too, spiritually, we do it in the baptismal tank. You see that. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised to the likeness of his resurrection, which means through that sacrifice, we do not have to be the same men and women that we were before. We cannot say, I can't. We have been given new life. And so this morning, how are we doing? How are we doing? And for many of us, we falter and fail because we never go back to the gospel. Oh, I got the gospel. That's where we start. No, that's where we live. We live there. Because the gospel grounds us. It brings us back to our sin and our redemption and the glory of what Christ has done. And it reminds us to follow in his steps. And so, my brother and sister, we are in a battle this morning. It's all the same. We have the plan. But you're going to be punched in the face. You will be. And when you do now, you have some steps to take. You've got to radically deal with your sin. You've got to seize the battle. We're in it. And you've got to seek the Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for your kindness, your goodness, your grace and strength. Oh, God, I pray that what we've heard this morning will not soon leave our hearts and our minds, that even today you would convict on areas that we know we have failed. And in the weeks to come, as we continue this topic and this series, that you would help us to know how to arm ourselves in a way that gives us obedience. Obedience for the moment, which can translate to obedience for a lifetime. Bless now this invitation and this song as a prayer, Lord, to remember that we have been resurrected, the, the glory and the power of Jesus Christ, um, our living hope. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about what you've just heard or are interested in the ministry of Maple City, please visit our website at maplecitybaptistchurch.com.